Give him a warm round of applause. 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 Give him I own a stethoscope, a tweedy jacket, and a swivel chair. That's pretty much all you need, isn't it? <laughs> and tonight, folks, I'm going to let you in a little secret. There's only one trick to being a good doctor, and that's making the right diagnosis. <laughs> Once you've made the right diagnosis, you can hide in a corner, look things up in a book, pretend to be clever, happy days. <laughs> or we at least have to pretend to be calm and clever, otherwise folks don't trust us. So we're like swans, sailing serenely on the surface, Paddling furiously underneath, and like swans, if you piss us off, we can break your arm with one swipe of an enormous wing. And on the bright side, only the queens are allowed to eat us, so that's nice. <laughs> there is a problem with making the right diagnosis, though, and that is that there are 10,000 recognised human diseases, 10,000 things that can go wrong with the human body. And I have to work it out by process of elimination. So it's like playing an enormous game of medical guess who. <laughs> so, do you affect men more than women? No. <laughs> do you largely affect kids or the elderly? No. <laughs> until we're getting more and more specific and more and more honed in until we're asking questions like, do you cause painful and unsightly pustular boils and skin creases? Yeah. You do? Yes! <laughs> I've got it. I mean, I've not got it. <laughs> You've got it, but I know what it is. And I'll tell you another interesting thing about being a GP, and when I say interesting, what I mean is not at all interesting, but at least it's true, <laughs> is that of the problems that come and see us, two-thirds of them, however horrible, however unpleasant, are self-limiting and will sort themselves out. So I've worked out that in the great game of medical guess who, NHS version, too many players, lots of vital parts missing, you can get this down to one question, which is, do you have a crappy diet, rubbish sleep, a mobile phone and too much stress? <laughs> you don't? <know>? Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be that then, isn't it? <laughs> of the remaining third, one in six have a long-term condition that we can manage, but was never going to go away. And the remaining one in six has something serious that we need to uh, deal with there and then. So what I was wondering is, the next time you go to the doctor, if before you come in, you could arrange to meet up, form some small groups, and come in in that order it would make my job an awful lot easier. <laughs> so it would be bit of a cold, bit of a cold, bit of a cold, bit of a cold, hypertension, West Nile baboon fever. <laughs> but it is disappointing. It's very disappointing. As long as I'm sitting in the magic swivel chair of cleverness, I might look like I have all the answers. But as soon as I stand up, I'm as rubbish as everybody else. <laughs> I'm like those famous people you see on Celebrity Mastermind or The Chase, people you think ought to be clever. You know the ones, politicians, newsreaders, journalists. You think they should be smart, but as soon as they open their mouths, you realise they're as thick as wins like the rest of us. It is a letdown. But one of those little letdowns that sort of sneaks in when you're not looking. You know the ones. Your password has not been recognised. <laughs> Ticketmaster, my password is password. How much more recognisable do you need? Or maybe we are experiencing an unexpectedly large volume of calls. Oh yeah? Unexpected by whom? <laughs> because I had an inkling. So much so that I've made a cup of coffee, two chocolate digesters, and the latest Thursday murder club to while away the next couple of hours <laughs> while my call is evidently so important to you. Or maybe you've been to the Christmas market. I love the Christmas market. Have we, have we been to the Christmas market yet? Yeah. Superb. Walking through the crowds in St Anne's Square with my young son. Glasses steamed up on a crisp December night. Each of us holding our mugs of volcanically hot Vimto. <laughs> yes, being jostled in a crowd, blind with a small child and a scald hazard. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> but what if I fancy something to eat? We could go to the hog roast, pig in a bap, 
piece of crackling the size of a human toenail for an extra quid. <laughs> but no, every year I get drawn as if by a fat man magnet to the hot dog stalls. I love the hot dog stalls. Every year I buy one, I never learn. I see them there, sizzling over the charcoal grill like cling film wrapped tubes of meat flavoured angel delight. <laughs> I buy one, 11 quid. Foot long hot dog, inexplicably small bread roll. <laughs> and I bite into it and it pops and that, what shall we call it, pig juice trickles down the back of my throat. And I remember why I didn't buy one for another 364 days. It's like biting into a used condom <laughs> without necessarily taking it off first. <laughs> but, but we digress. Even with health-related stuff, I'm rubbish. I went to the dentist a week ago. I started fine. How are you today? Oh, oh, oh. I wanted to swallow. The drool's building up at the back of my mouth, but she has a metal spike, a steel hook, and what feels like a Black & Decker mains-operated electric cheese grater balanced at the back of my mouth, so I sit very still. And then I hit the drool event horizon. <laughs> Ken Bruce's pop master is playing in the background. And I hear myself, to my horror, gargling along to the high bits of Mariah Carey's I Can't Live If Living Was Without You. But she was very kind, very forgiving, even though spattered with spittle. In fact, she only actually asked me to leave when I asked the, uh, the dental hygienist if the dental record she was keeping was how they would identify my body if I was dragged out of a canal in the opening sequence to an episode of Taggart, <laughs> or stumbled across by dog walkers. But casualty, that's what I was worst. I took up beekeeping a few years ago when I retired from playing rugby. I thought it'd be a nice, safe, gentle hobby. That was an error. An interesting thing about being stung by a bee is that it releases a pheromone, which angers other bees, so they sting you, which angers more bees, so they sting you, and so on, and so on, and so on, until you have a whole hive of 60,000 bees really pissed off with you. It's like the Fibonacci sequence with ambulances. <laughs> and the other problem with being stung by what the casualty consultant sensitively referred to as a whole fuckload of bees <laughs> is that you swell up. But you don't just swell up where you've been stung. Oh no, you swell up everywhere. So my, my trunk swelled up, my limbs swelled up, my scalp's up. How do you get a fat scalp? <laughs> but I knew that I was in deep trouble when the swelling got so bad that it took up the slack in the wrinkles of my scrotum. So moody I looked like a fat man on a medium-sized space hopper. <laughs> But what really let, my, let me know I was in trouble was the cardiac monitor. Now, I'm no cardiologist, but I know that is a problem for three reasons. Number one, that's too fast. Number two, it's irregular. And number three, in Morse code, that just spelt out, your heart is fucked. <laughs> Look, ladies and gentlemen, the central chest pain is coming back, so my time is up for two reasons. Thank you so much for listening to me. Enjoy the rest of you.